Really great day, great season, great time. It's great to see so many people this morning. And, um, you know, this time of year, it's busy. Uh, it can feel more stressful than it should. Uh, one person told me that if, if Christmas is stressing you out, you're doing it wrong. You know, there's just a lot of stuff pulling, a lot of things going on this time of year. So thank you for carving out space to be here today. The second thing that occurred to me when I walked into the building, and I, I pray this isn't a bomb, but more like a, a great moment, this is the last Christmas service that we will have in this building. So, amen. Thank you for that response. I appreciate sharing this moment with you. It's historic. And we'll look back on this day. And we'll look back on this building. What God has done in this little, this little venue, what God has done in Eagle, and what he's done with this church, uh, it's amazing. We've gone a lot further than what people told me we'd do. I had, I had people tell me, and I know now they were just being mean-spirited, but I had people tell me what we could or could not do because we're a rural area. It's a small community. Well, I tell you what, if you will trust God with a little, he'll multiply, he'll expand it. And us moving into a new venue, that, that just more of the same, allowing us that same love, that same message, that same culture that we all enjoy. Now we have more seats for others to enjoy. So thank you for participating in that, praying over the building process, pledging your money. I mean, just over two years, uh, we have raised more than $424,000. I just, it's a great testament to the vision and your commitment to it. So thank you so much. So we talk about Christmas. There's a lot of things that flood my mind when preparing for the Christmas message. And I think as I uh, begin to talk with people, uh, both people that are walking with the Lord and those that are kind of yet to have found him or found him yet. There's, there's a familiarity sometimes when it comes to the Christmas story. It's a historical event. It really happened. But sometimes we get so used to it, we kind of lump it into Rudolph or Santa or some other just Christmas festiveness, and, and we can lose the potency. And there are people that are in our services this weekend that, uh, you know, you two probably have heard it before, and it, it can become very, you know, familiar. And if we're not careful, we'll We'll kind of just endure it, or perhaps there are people that we, we tease or jokingly call the Christmas and Easter only crowd. Um, I'm starting to get a real compassion for those people because I, I've been in different venues where I wouldn't want to go back either. And sometimes Christmas and Easter is the only time they feel like they can endure it. So I'm glad that you came to, to celebrate with us. And I'm not, I did not mean to sound mean-spirited toward other churches like they're doing it wrong. I'm just saying, I'm stirred up in a, in a, in a conversation yesterday that I had with some family members of mine that are, are, they don't go to church. They're not, they're not actively pursuing a walk with the Lord. And I was able to share with them that there, there, there is no shortage of church buildings. There are no shortage of opportunities. It, and it's not that people are rejecting church or rejecting Jesus or rejecting the Bible, at least not like directly, we just need to help them see the relevance and the power behind experiencing God, just not knowing about him or having some religious dogma or doctrine memorized, but really experiencing it. And the value of a community, the, the success that we have is the strength of the community. And we need one another. Last week we talked about that. We need each other. And just being available is a powerful thing to invite somebody. Like I said, you could drive by probably five churches on your, on your way here from home, maybe more, depending on where you live. It's not a matter of having a, a, a sign out there saying, church starts at 10. There's an, an invitation that's needed. And usually when someone knows you and they value you, they'll give it a try. So thank you again for, if that's you, giving it a try. I'm glad you're here. But as I begin to study and prepare again for Christmas message, I begin to see again, that there's, there's nothing boring about this. It's extraordinary, it's risky, um, it's, it's powerful, and there's some nuggets in this that I think that perhaps we need to be reminded, at very least, and for some of us, maybe even see or broaden what that looks like. So let me begin this morning by going to the, a very familiar Christmas passage, beginning in Luke chapter 1. I'm going to read, at, starting at verse number 26. During the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy... The angel Gabriel was sent from God's presence to an unmarried girl named Mary living in Nazareth, a village in Galilee. She was engaged to a man named Joseph, a true descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Grace to you, young woman, for the Lord is with you. 
and so you are anointed with great favor. Mary was deeply troubled over the words of the angel and bewildered over what this may mean for her. But the angel reassured her, saying, Do not yield to your fear, Mary, for the Lord has found delight in you and chosen and has chosen to surprise you with a wonderful gift. You will become pregnant with a baby boy, and you are, you are to name him Jesus. He will be supreme and will be known as the son of the highest. And the Lord God will enthrone him as king on his ancestor David's throne. He will reign as king of Israel forever, and his reign will have no limit. Mary said, but how could this happen? I'm still a virgin. Gabriel answered, the spirit of holiness will fall upon you, and the almighty God will spread his shadow of power over you in a cloud of glory. This is why the child born to you will be holy, and he will be called the son of God. What's more, your aged aunt Elizabeth has also become pregnant with a son. The barren one is now in her sixth month. Not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. Then Mary responded, saying, This is amazing. I will be a mother for the Lord. As his servant, I accept whatever he has for me. That's one powerful statement. May everything you have told me come to pass, and the angel left her. There's a lot going on here. You, you, you got to be reminded, perhaps, that there's been 400 years of silence from the heavens. There hasn't been prophecy. There hasn't been encounters with angels. And, and this, this young lady is, is awoken by an angelic being, dropping a bomb like, you're going to be pregnant? And she's trying to take it in and, and understand that, well, number one, I mean, logically, how is this going to work? I've never been with a man. Number two, I'm kind of engaged. This is a big deal. She's already engaged. This is, this is like tabloid material. According to Jewish custom, Mary would have only been between 12 and 14 years old. She's a young girl who responded in such a mature way that so be it, whatever you say, I will do what the Lord asks of me. She's an unheard of girl from a poor working class village. Unheard of. And this is what we learn from Mary. Mary shows us that the gift of God inside of us will change the world if we're willing to confront our personal discomfort. Let that settle in just for a moment. Now, obviously, I've never carried a baby, but I've watched my wife carry four. I know it's not the same, ladies. I'm just saying. I've just witnessed it. But I'm not talking about the anxiety of your first child. I'm not talking about the discomfort of, of your, your body swelling while it carries this growing person inside of you. I'm not talking about that level of discomfort. We're talking about the fact that this young girl is engaged. And, and the, the, the original text uses the word betrothed, a little bit, little bit different, but mostly the same, meaning that though they had not consummated the marriage, though they hadn't pursued the, the actual moment, they were still under the same requirements as if they were married, meaning that if Mary went out and was with another man, it was counted unto her as adultery. And that, under the Mosaic law, was a death sentence. The discomfort of accusations and the murmuring and the whispers and, and the scaredness of, of, of explaining to people, by the way, she's engaged to a guy named Joe. Imagine that conversation. This is big. This is risky. This is facing her discomfort. The message that we've got to take away from this is that whatever gift is within you, it's going to cause you some discomfort. Some people are going to think a thing. They're going to say some stuff. And we've got to be prepared to go through that if, if we want to help change the world. So let's look at Joseph's encounter. In Matthew's gospel, chapter 1, beginning in verse number 18. This was how Jesus, God's anointed one, was born. His mother Mary had promised Joseph to be his wife. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Her fiancé, fiance Joseph, was a righteous man, full of integrity, and didn't want to disgrace her. But when he learned of her pregnancy, he secretly planned to break the engagement. Fellas, can you blame him? I know she said God said. 
but come on. The Bible is so awesome because it's so real. Do you know he could leave those type of things out to make him sound like he was just, it was super easy for him? But it wasn't. He heard it, he didn't like it, and he was thinking about ditching her. And he has an encounter, a dream with, with God. Verse number 20, while he was still debating within himself about what to do, he fell asleep and had a supernatural dream. An angel from the Lord appeared to him in clear light and said, Joseph, descendant of David, don't hesitate to take Mary into your home as your wife because the power of the Holy Spirit has conceived a child in her womb. She will give birth to a son and you will name him Savior for he is destined to give his life to save the people from their sins. This happened so that what the Lord spoke through this prophet would come true. Listen, a virgin will be pregnant and will give birth to a son, and he will be known as Emmanuel, which means in Hebrew, God became one of us. When Joseph awoke from the dream, he did all the angel of the Lord instructed him to do. He took Mary to be his wife, but they refrained from having sex until, the, uh, until she gave birth to her son, whom they named Jesus. The lesson that we learned from Mary is that if we will allow the gift of God in us to be used, we're gonna to have to face our discomfort. The lesson that I believe that we can learn from Joseph is this. Joseph shows us that our obedience can change the world if we're willing to feel foolish in our faithfulness. Feel foolish in our faithfulness. Now, Mary gets a lot of street cred, right? I mean, she, after all, carried the Savior inside of her. But Joseph had to risk his reputation. He had to risk at the word. He had to believe by faith that he himself also heard from God and made the decision to go ahead and, and go into this venue together with her in something he had nothing to go back on. As far as he knew, as far as anyone knew, this had never happened. This was radical. If you've ever had an experience that was isolated to you, just you and God, and you try to tell somebody about it, Sometimes you like, people get, oh, sure, right? This was a biggie. Joseph's young too. According to Hebrew culture, he would have been between 16 and 18 years old. So these are young people that are making some really mature decisions. As I mentioned, engaged or betrothed has some similarities to what we would consider the engagement process. In the ancient culture, there was a time of preparation where they were learning and uh, gaining courtship, knowing one another, not in a, in a physical way, but just in an emotional, spiritual way. A dowry was given to the father for the bride. The, um, the, though the marriage was not consummated, they still were under that same legal requirement. And as I mentioned, her becoming pregnant without ever being with Joseph would have been an assumption that she had committed adultery and would have been stoned under the Mosaic law. But their journey to Bethlehem is another story of its own. Mary is uber pregnant. As we're about to read, when she arrives in Bethlehem, she goes into labor. And the journey between where they're at to Bethlehem was not an easy task. Let's look at Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse number 1. During those days, the Roman emperor, Caesar Augustus, ordered that the first census be taken throughout his empire. Everyone had to travel to his or her own hometown to complete the mandatory census. So Joseph and his fiancée Mary left Nazareth, a, uh, a village in Galilee, and journeyed to their hometown in Judea, to the village of Bethlehem, King David's ancient home. They were required to register there since they were both direct descendants of David. Mary was pregnant and nearly ready to give birth. When they arrived in Bethlehem, Mary went into labor, and there she gave birth to her firstborn son. After wrapping the newborn baby in stripes, strips of cloth, they laid him in a feed trough, since there was no available space in any upper room in the village. The trip from the highlands of Nazareth to Bethlehem was about 90 miles. To give some reference, it's, it's approximately 100 miles from here to Detroit. So for them to make a trip, it wasn't like they were going to jump into a nice cushy car. She either walked with Joseph 
or she, she mixed it with walking and riding on a pack animal, likely a donkey. Not good suspension on a donkey. And we're talking about the woman who was carrying the Lord, so pregnant that when she arrived, she goes into labor. So they would have averaged probably 10 miles a day to make their trip. Doing quick math, we're talking eight, nine days of, of, of being on the back of an animal and walking. Now, this trip was, was also a dangerous trip because of the territory. It was a very forested area in the valley, which meant that there were predators, lions, bears, and boars, all known to attack and be aggressive to people. In addition to the, the up and down trip of the, of the thick forest and, and the, the, the path that they would have taken, there were, there were, it was a very trafficked area. So there were desert pirates, there were robbers and thieves that would look for a young couple that they could take advantage of. Oftentimes people would make that trip in a, in a pack for, because of simply safety in numbers. Now we don't know if they were with a larger group or if they made the trip alone, but either way, it was a dangerous trip to be made. In the ancient Palestine area, the, the bandits and robbers would potentially take their belongings, which would have been meet, meager anyway, because they weren't wealthy people, they were young, and what they packed to eat, they had to barely have enough to, to carry, and so carrying much would have been probably handfuls of grain or, or, or some bread. All their provisions would have been on their back or on the back of an animal. So when they arrive in Bethlehem, the city's swarming. They're not the only ones who had to go there to register. And so when they begin to try to find a place to rent, everything's rented. There's no place to stay. It wasn't like they were isolated. Sometimes I've, I've had uh, read some commentaries where people think, well, they were alone rejected because of who they were. I, I actually think that it was just literally overwhelmed the town with all of the people. And typically within Hebrew culture, when you would go to another town or travel, you stayed with family but they didn't have family there to stay with. And so their only option was to stay out in the, the, uh, the space where animals would have been kept. Some of you decorate your house real nice and you've got a nativity scene perhaps on your mantle and it looks so peaceful and, and nice and cozy and, and private, but it would have been anything but. They literally would have been within arm's reach of donkeys and other animals that were being kept there. In addition... There would have been other people. There were other people in the same predicament looking for a place to stay for the night. And this is where Mary is going to give birth. When Becky and I were in the delivery room, we had a doctor, a nurse, and me. And of course, Becky. <laughs> she was kind of the center of our attention. Uh, there's very few activities that happen in the life of a woman that's more vulnerable than giving birth pretty exposed, right, ladies? And this young girl, 12 to 14 years old, her first child, she's in the space where animals are being kept and there's people all around. This is amazing to me, what she had to endure, the discomfort that she went through to bring the greatest gift that ever came into the world. The angels go visit the shepherds outside the city limits. Let's look at Luke chapter 2. Verse number eight. That night, in a field near Bethlehem, there were shepherds watching over their flocks. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared in radiant splendor before them, lighting up the field with the blazing glory of God, and the shepherds were terrified. The angel reassured them, saying, Don't be afraid, for I have come to bring you good news, the most joyous news the world has ever heard. And it is for you... Excuse me, it is for everyone, everywhere. For today in Bethlehem, a rescuer was born for you. He is the Lord Yahweh, the Messiah. You will recognize him by this miracle sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in stripes of clothes, lying in a feeding trough. Then all at once, a vast number of glorious angels appeared, the very armies of heaven. And they all praised God, singing glory to God in the highest realms of heaven. For there is peace and good hope given to the sons of men. When the choir of angels disappeared back to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go. Let's hurry and find this word that is born in Bethlehem 
and see for ourselves what the Lord has revealed to us. So they ran into the village and found their way to Mary and Joseph. And there was a baby lying in a feeding trough. Upon seeing the miraculous sign, the shepherds recounted what had just happened. Everyone who heard the shepherd's story was astonished by what they were told. But Mary treasured all these things in her heart and often pondered what they meant. The shepherds returned to their flock, ecstatic over what had happened. They praised God and glorified him for all they had heard and seen for themselves, just like the angel had said. Shepherds uh, in, the, in the trade, it was a noble profession. It was an honest day's work. But there were some downsides sides to shepherding as well. The shepherds had a hard time maintaining religious purity as the Pharisees defined it because they were watching the sheep that would actually be prepared for the sacrifice in the temple, and it was unsafe to lead them unattended. Shepherds spent most of their times away from the general population. Shepherds also smelled like sheep. In the modern terms, they would be considered a blue collar, uh, largely unnoticed in those, uh, by those who have power or authority. Their jobs made them very little to no money. They came from the lower rung of society, and they were not important, not in personality, not in politics or economy. In fact, shepherds weren't even allowed to testify in the courts. Why, why the emphasis on the shepherds? Because there's a third lesson that I think we can learn from this part of the story. If God chose to reveal his glory first to shepherds, then the king of glory is making an important statement to each one of us personally. If you've ever felt unnoticed, under the radar, voiceless, powerless, not from the right uh, family line, not the right pedigree, then you are a prime candidate for God to show off greatly. It's something personal that, that we've got to grab a hold of of all of the people that could have been uh, notified and the heavens breaking open, which according to history was something also very brand new. The Pharisees and the religious leaders of the temple, they didn't get the experience. These, these no-named individuals, none of them are given a name or recorded in history. They're the shepherds. I'm, I'm part of that company. I'm part of that no-name that, that God has spoken to that's rescued. I was reading this commentary, and I, so I just want to share it with you. It says, the story of Jesus' birth is not just something from long ago or far away. The story of lowly and forgotten shepherds keeping watch out in the fields is more than a historical event. Shepherds being the first to hear the Savior's birth is not just a story about shepherds and angels and a poor family with no place to put their newborn baby boy. This is a story about God's grace and Jesus' love for you and for me. What I think I love best about the Christmas story is what it reveals about God. What it reveals about God's intention toward humanity. One of the most popular verses in all of Scripture reveals the most powerful truth of God's opinion and value for you and I is found in John chapter 3, verse number 16. John 3, 16 was written many years after Jesus had ascended. John was of the inner circle the, of the 12. He was even of the three that got to experience the Mount of Transfiguration. And, and some historians would say that John was like a best friend to Jesus. The Gospel of John, written by John, John refers to himself as the one that Jesus loves. You got to be pretty confident in your relationship when you're dropping a note like that, right? John chapter 3, verse number 16 is another familiar verse that if we're not careful, we'll lose the potency of it. Let me read it to you. For this is how much God loved the world, how much he gave his one and only unique son as a gift. So now everyone who believes in him will never perish, but experience everlasting life. 
This was not a good cop, bad cop scenario. This isn't Jesus just being the guardian over you and the guardian over me to keep us from God who actually wants to get you. The salvation, the rescuer that came was the father's idea. The gift that he gave wasn't just a prophet. It wasn't just a priest. It wasn't an individual. It was the very best that he could give of himself, his own son. It reveals his value and his love for humanity. Now, perhaps more than ever, we need to be reminded of God's love towards a broken, lost world. Please say amen. amen. Though John 3.16 is probably the most familiar of all verses, the very next verse is probably the most unfamiliar. Yet, the next verse, verse number 17, is the knockout punch. Let me read it. God did not send his son into the world to judge and condemn the world, but to be its savior and to rescue it. The plan was to save and rescue. If there was ever somebody that could come in and demolish every bad person, every unrighteous act, it was Jesus. And instead, he laid his life down for us. He showed us what it looks like to love and we need a lesson. We need to be shown. And, and, and some of us think, well, no, no, I, I got love. I understand love. I, I'm practicing unconditional love. Are you? Are you? I'm not so sure I am all the time, most of the time. I'll, I'll prove it. Well, let's just do a little test. I do a lot of weddings. I've done a lot of weddings, okay? Kind of goes with the job. And uh, there's a precious moment in every wedding that I look forward to. It's the moment where I'm standing about right here and right next to me is the groom and the bride is about to come in sight. I'll never forget that moment for me. When, when Becky turned the corner in the little church that we got married in, I literally lost my breath. It was like someone sucked it right out of me. It was the most beautiful thing, most beautiful moment I've ever seen. So I learned a little something along the way. When the bride comes into view, when I'm officiating, I really don't look at her. I watch him. I do, because I love it. I love that moment. Just when, when you're, you're, you, have, you don't know where to register this. It's just the most amazing thing. So go with me. Imagine you're, we're, we're all at a wedding right now, and, I, and I've got a groom sitting here, and we're waiting for the bride to come through the back door, and the door opens, and the father has the daughter... And instead of her getting emotional, she begins to scream, No! You can't make me! I won't do it! <laughs> I'd like to see if our groom would be so overwhelmed with emotion that he would say, Oh, just come on. Now, he'd probably make a run for it. Because we are programmed for conditional love. So we need to know what it looks like to love unconditionally. And so we have the model given to us, the same author just a few years later, 1 John chapter 4, verse number 10. We read what love really is. This is love. He loved us long before we loved him. It was his love, not ours. He proved it by sending his son to be the pleasing sacrificial offering to take away our sins. It is the greatest gift, the greatest message that we could ever tell. May it never become familiar. May it never lose its potency. May it never lose the awe moment of what we've been given. His first move, his rescue, the Savior came and did it so different than anyone expected. And he did it so he could relate to you and I and that we know our Savior isn't out there somewhere. He's close by. He knows your struggle. He knows your pain. If you feel far from God today, the simple prayer is this, I'm far, I need you. If you've never encountered him before and you're, you, you've had a different idea of what God looks like, my hope is that you would go back and see what I've told you when I've read is true. And look around the room. There are billboards, people that you can trust that are experiencing what we're talking about in their everyday life, not just on Sunday. It's the gift that just keeps reproducing and keeps on giving. It's the yielding, the separating ourselves unto him, giving him our all. 
and knowing that it's not just about getting there when we die. It's about getting heaven into us because he died for us. It's a whole new way of living. Amen. Would you stand with me? I'd like to pray. Thank you, Father. Lord, I pray right now over every soul that's in this building, every person that was watching this video online, that there would be a courageous moment of yielding. Each one of us, no matter where our starting point is, if today is our first time, we acknowledge that we're broken and far, but we want to be fixed and whole and be brought near. So we simply confess that we can't do it on our own and that we need a rescuer. And now by your grace, we're empowered to do different, to live different. God, to follow you and allow you to do what only you can do in the heart of a person who is yielded. For anyone in this place or anyone watching online that feels far from, from the Lord, it is simple as turning away your focus from what you're looking at back onto the greatest gift ever. He's never moved. He's never left. It's a yielding moment again, a fresh commitment that's needed. God, that the weights would be lifted, the burdens would be removed, the calluses would be re replaced with tenderness, and God, our, our sensitivity to hearing you and sensing you would be re renewed. God, I thank you for this time, this season, and this week ahead of us. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.